Good evening. Welcome. I'm John. I'm a bookseller at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're so pleased to welcome Heather, Heather Radke this evening to our At Home with Literati series in support of Butts, a backstory, and in conversation with Leslie Jameson. Just a quick webinar overview for those of you who are just joining us. The chat is closed this evening, but you can keep the chat window open. I'll be sharing links to purchase Butts, a backstory from Literati Bookstore throughout the event. And I'll also in the chat be encouraging you to use the Q&A feature to submit any questions you have this evening. I'll read a selection of your questions at the conclusion of the conversation. And live transcription is available to you on your toolbar as well, using the CC icon down there. And if you're watching us later on YouTube, there are always links to purchase books in the description directly below me. You can also subscribe to our channel and be kept up to date with all of our at home with Literati events when they become available there. Our virtual event series will continue into 2023. And as a reminder, you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And if you live in Southeast Michigan or the Ann Arbor area, our doors are open to the public for in-store shopping. But most of all, we'd just like to thank you for your attendance this evening uh, or much later this evening or this morning or this afternoon, depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us. But without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's author and our interlocutor. Heather Radke is an essayist, journalist, and contributing editor and reporter at Radiolab, the Peabody award-winning program from WNYC. She has written for publications including The Believer, Long Reads, and The Paris Review, and she teaches at Columbia University's Creative Writing MFA program. Before becoming a writer, Heather worked as a curator at the Jane Addams Hull House Museum in Chicago. Speaking with her this evening, Leslie Jameson is the New York Times bestselling author of The Empathy Exams, The Recovering, Make It Scream, Make It Burn, and a novel, The Gin Closet. She teaches at Columbia University and lives in Brooklyn with her family. Please join me in welcoming Heather Radke and Leslie Jameson into your living rooms. Um, Heather, congratulations. Hello. Happy uh -huh. Um, um, it's it's uh it's been such a pleasure and and thrill really to get to be witness to the evolution and and coming into being of this amazing book over the years um and it just is such an honor to be able to launch it into the world with you um and just talk about it and celebrate it and um yeah. 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 Thank you so much. And thank you. I mean, thank you to Literati for hosting. And I, I was saying before this started that I, um, I was a bookseller at an independent bookstore in Ann Arbor when I was in college. It was called Shaman Drum. And it feels very close to my heart to be able to launch the book uh, with Literati and in, in Ann Arbor, virtually at least. And it's such a pleasure and an honor to be in conversation with you, Leslie, who has, has, you know, been with this book from the beginning and with me from the beginning as in my like journey to be a writer. So thank you so much for doing this. Well, and one of the things that um, I know that to kick things off, we're going to get to hear you read a little bit, which I'm really excited about too. But um, one of the things I want to ask you tons of just craft nerd questions about is just all the stages that this book has been through and all the chapters in its life cycle. But I can, yeah, I can remember seeing bits and pieces of it in the um in the classrooms of Dodge Hall, where we do our work in the Columbia program, and um, just getting to getting to really, I'm I'm constantly humbled and like deeply, almost like tearfully inspired by just what a magnificent and demanding and beautiful thing it is for a book like this that holds mm -hmm. so much of the world and so much history and so much of your voice and so much heart, you know, just to watch it come into being. It's a huge, it's a huge thing and a gift to the world. So. Oh, thank you so much. Um, so are you going to kick us off by reading a little bit and then we'll start? Yeah, yeah that's perfect. So I'm going to just read from the very beginning. Um, yeah, and also thanks for everybody to, for coming tonight. It's, it's so nice to have everybody here. Okay, so this is right from the, the very first page. The first but I remember isn't my own. It's my mother's. 
At seven years old, I would sit on the fluffy toilet seat cover in my parents' bathroom and watch her get ready for the day, standing in front of the mirror in her bra and underwear, smearing lotion onto her body. She rolled Velcro curlers into her short brown hair, a few girthy pink ones on top, several smaller green ones on the sides. She cracked the window to let out the steam of the shower and the Michigan morning air, cold and thick, woke me up. Close your eyes, she told me, and as I did, she liberally doused her hair with hairspray. I held my breath, fearing the sticky choke. Then she took her glasses off and leaned in close to the mirror and curled her lashes, her butt sticking out as she leaned over the counter. As a young girl, my mom's was the only naked body, the only naked adult body I'd ever seen. I imagined all women's bodies looked like hers, shapely and short with full breasts and an ample butt that filled out any pair of pants. I liked the idea that one day my body would look the same, a fate that seemed as inevitable as growing taller or getting my period. She was beautiful and free as she went about her morning ablutions. The clear-sightedness of childhood allowed me to see my mother's butt for what it actually was, a body part like any other, something to love because I loved the human it was part of, it was, a not, it was not a problem or a blessing. It was only a fact. What I did not know then is that butts are not so simple. They are not like elbows or knees, functional body parts that carry few associations beyond their physiological function. Instead, butts, silly as they may often seem, are tremendously complex symbols, fraught with significance and nuance, laden with humor and sex, shame and history. Women's butts have been used as means to create and reinforce racial hierarchies, as a barometer for the virtues of hard work, and as a measure for sexual desire and availability. Despite, or perhaps because of, the fact that there's little a person can do to dramatically change the way their butt looks without surgical intervention, the shape and size of a woman's butt has long been perceived as indicator of her very nature, her morality, her femininity, and even her humanity. But butts can be hard to see clearly. The fact that they are on our backside and mean that they are somewhat alien to us, even as they are perfectly visible to others. To see your butt, you need the cocoon of mirrors of a dressing room, the cumbersome triangulation of a hand mirror in a bedroom, or an awkwardly held smartphone. And when you catch sight of your butt, or at least when I catch sight of my butt, there's always a bit of a surprise. That's what's trailing me? There's a note of humiliation in this. We don't ever really know what someone else is seeing when they look at our butts, which makes us vulnerable. There's also a giving over. In some ways, the butt belongs to the viewer more than the viewed. It can be observed secretly, ogled in private, creepily scrutinized. In order to know how a pair of pants fit, I must ask a salesperson how my butt looks because I cannot see for myself. A woman passes a man on the street and his head turns to look at her butt. Although everyone else on the street may spot the greedy glance, the woman may not and doesn't realize she's being assessed, criticized, objectified, desired. I, as you know, I love the opening of this book so much. I love that you begin um, in a particular and personal moment and follow that moment into history um, because moments, we talk about this so much, but moments are always living inside of history and shaped by it and pointing towards it in all of these directions if we just ask them enough questions and look closely enough at them in this book in a way um explodes that opening moment in so many in so many different ways um and I love those you know that kind of moving from it was only a fact to um those layers of humor and sex and shame and history and I thought I would start by asking you um really where where this book began for you where 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 and how you kind of came to your own version of this trajectory that different people go through when they hear about the book or critics when they respond to the book, like kind of thinking, having almost like that nervous giggle of like, oh, a book about butts and then realizing, yeah, it's a book about history and race and power and sex and pretty much everything worth thinking and writing about. So how, what was your own kind of journey to thinking this could be a book and what would it mean to write about this thing that, that, that makes us giggle and and also holds everything? Yeah, I mean, it's such a good question. I feel like I've been answering it a lot lately. And there's like one kind of answer I, I usually give, which is definitely true, which is that I, when I was early in the Columbia MFA, I was working on a couple of essays, one for your class, one for Hilton Alls' class um, about sort of bodies and shame. And I was really interested in kind of 
the ways that the shame I felt about my butt when I was younger, it wasn't huge. It wasn't, you know, life altering, although it turned out it kind of was, but not for the reason I thought, but it just felt sort of mundane. It felt like a kind of um, experience a lot of people have while thinking about their bodies, which is like, I didn't feel great about it. And it felt sort of just like that was something that, you know, just was inevitable that like all, all women, all people on some level felt bad about their bodies and that this was how I felt bad about mine. And you like, what are you going to do about like no big deal in a way. And the smallness of it actually kind of interested me um, because it felt really common, I think. And I am really interested artistically in small things. Um, and when I wrote, so I wrote these two small essays, just, you know, sort of sketches essentially, and seeing how they were received in, in workshop environments, I was actually like, I maybe hadn't fully thought through like how, if you just say the word, but out loud, people get like, kind of like silly. They have like, there's always a re I mean, if there's anything I know <laughs> over the last five years, there's always a reaction. It's very rare. You say the word, but to somebody and they don't have some kind of like giggle or like, Whoa, like, wait, what? Like, <laughs> um, and I, I thought that was pretty interesting too. Cause I was like, well, what's so powerful about butts? It's not like that dirty. It's not like super sexual. It's not, um, super crass. So it's a little bit less than all of those. And I was kind of just like, hi, huh, I wonder if there's something there, but kind of before any of that, when I worked at Hull House, which was this place, it was a very special place in a lot of ways. That time in that version of that museum was, we were, we really believed we could make a public program or an exhibit about anything. And it sort of became a joke that like, you know, it was this museum with this feminist history and that like, there was a, always a joke that like I could link anything to the history of Hull House. Like it almost became kind of a challenge. And before I even came to Columbia, I had sort of been joking around with some of my colleagues about doing an exhibit about butts. And so I think that that had kind of already sparked the idea of like, how, like, what would that be? What, you know, could, could you take it seriously? Like what, like what might this thing hold? And then when I actually started to really work on those essays and workshop them and start to do the research, I really realized how capacious and um, robust the, the category it was. Yeah, and I love that you touched on both the kind of um, the sorts of meaning that reside in smallness or those parts of life that are almost so daily or so common or so shared or so ordinary that they start to feel transparent to us or like they don't matter and um, but of course they do maybe they matter more than anything else because that's where life happens and you teach this wonderful class at Columbia called small potatoes that is exploring that and allowing students to to who are so hungry to kind of almost be given permission to write about those parts of their lives so it's you're simultaneously sort of talking about smallness as a part of the aesthetic of this book but also of course it's capaciousness I think is like a huge part of the experience of reading it just how much um how 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 deep you go into history I mean even evolutionary scale history and and certainly sort of um the past few centuries of of uh, cultural history um but also kind of just telling so many fascinating stories within that span. So I I would love, I mean, we get, you know, Sarah Bartman, um, we get twerking, we get um, a drag show that we went together to actually in Astoria many years ago, we get Buns of Steel, um, we get, you know, kind of why the human body is even built this way to have a butt. Um, I'm wondering if you could just talk us through how you found, um, how you found the stories that, felt important to tell um, and kind of a little bit like what you wanted different stories to do for the book like you know so, so sort of like how do you go from zero to 60 like how do you go from thinking about butts, thinking about shame thinking about this part of the body that is connected to so much and then figure out okay what's the terrain here like what are the stories I'm going to tell and how is each one going to illuminate my questions from a different angle yeah I, I mean 
Yeah, this, I feel like one thing I definitely think about this book is it could have been so many other books and there, you know, there was this sort of really important thing to me about the subtitle, which is that it be a backstory instead of the backstory, because it, to me that sort of was one way of marking that like, this was only one version of this story of, of the butt. Um, and part of what I was trying to communicate about that is like, it's sort of idiosyncratic why I chose these things. I mean, there's definitely an answer to that question, but it's like part of it is that's what nonfiction voice is to me in some ways. It's like the where my particular form of curiosity landed. Um, I like some of the first research I did was about the bustle, and I knew I would. The story of Sarah Bartman was something I knew, and bless you, and um, and I knew, of course, that she would be part of the book and. So I started to do the research about the bustle and I realized the links to Sarah Bartman's life and story and legacy that were part of that. And I, you know, as, as a person who had done a lot of work with objects in museums, I became, I sort of started to travel through some of the research based on objects. Um, and then I also was kind of aware I, I was really struggling for a long time as you may remember to find a spine for the book and I you know I wondered if it would be categories of inquiry you know like race and gender or if it would be um you know almost like like object based like it could could there be one that's just like based around the bustle and go kind of through the the various kind of spokes off that that hub but I ended up kind of landing on a more chronological approach. And then I wanted to make sure that there, I had also kind of um, ticked some boxes about like not leaving too many years uncovered once I had decided on the time, time span. And that actually pre like created a pretty fun challenge. Like mm -hmm. one of my favorite chapters was the one about these statues, Norma and Norman, who, which were made weirdly by a scientist and a, or an artist and a gynecologist, which is like a fun combo. Of people. <laughs> an artist and, <laughs> and they were, they were trying to like literally make, you know, codify what a normal body was. And they made these statues based on this data. And basically like, I found this pretty intense, like pretty wild story that, you know, went through the, you know, touches on the history of women's sizing and the history of eugenics um, based because I knew I wanted something from this time period in American history, the thirties and the forties. And I, um, I kind of had a hunch that like eugenicists surely got involved in this somehow, because this is like what eugenicists were up to as they were trying to police bodies. And I, ended up talking to somebody at the University of Michigan who I was doing some reporting on about, about eugenics in Michigan. And I was just like, do you happen to know what eugenicists thought about butt, butts? And she told me about these statues. So, and I think that's a kind of good example about, of how this, this kind of reporting worked for me is like, I had some idea mm -hmm. about a time period or like I knew in the eighties, I like wanted to do something about buns of steel because I, but I didn't know what, and then I just kind of kept digging and looking at it from different angles until I found the story that felt most compelling to tell from that era or about a certain topic or et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And there's really, there's the, that there's a feeling of narrative animating each section, whether it's a story that attaches to a particular person or the story of, uh, uh, like a dance movement or the story of a particular kind of uh, like a fitness movement like you feel you never feel like you're just sort of like traveling across information you always feel like you're following that that sense of history as story which can almost it's the kind of work that can when it's done well disappear into the experience mm -hmm. of a text I think but of course it's always the function of choices to figure out exactly as you're saying like where the story is or what would be an illuminating story to tell um and I'm wondering I mean and I also love that you talked about uh the ways that there's a certain like that sometimes a feeling of necessity or having to fill in the gaps around decades or time periods actually took you to some of the stories that are now most exciting or like particular favorites because I think if you can do that in the writing process it's so dynamic for both the writer and the reader to turn sort of necessity or like 
uh, the thing, the thing you're wrestling with or the thing that's missing to turn it into kind of surprise and possibility mm -hmm. and, holding and, and to kind of honor that, yeah, you sometimes get there by way of a feeling of like lack or necessity or something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, this, the, the next question I want to ask is like really connected to that actually, which is like, if you could take us to a few moments of real surprise for you in the writing of the book whether it was surprise in terms of discovering something from history some story from history or whether it was surprise in terms of the craft of the book somehow or surprise in terms of like something from your own life that you started to think about differently mm -hmm. once you'd encountered these histories yeah I mean I, I think the the one I've been pointing to most often is like the thing that surprised me is the, the history of women's sizing. And I think, and I'll talk about that, but there's a couple other ones I think that maybe would be fun to talk about too, which is the, the history of women's sizing. It was definitely kind of, um, I guess I was, I ended up feeling really, like, I, I was like, of course, there's going to be some nefarious wackadoodle history of women's sizing, like, obviously, right? Like, it feels like there's just no way there's not. And while there, there, there is, of course, there kind of is. There, it's also, I think the thing that I was really interested in is that um, women, like that it's sort of impossible to make clothes fit women's bodies or really to fit most bodies. It's a lot easier for uh, male identified bodies because there's just less like bulges basically and bulges are very unpredictable, but that basically the cl clothing manufacturers they know that it, the clothes aren't going to fit you and they're kind of doing their best but it's just like not feasible it's not possible it's too it's not just that it's too it's expensive it's like if you really wanted all your clothes to fit you would have to get them all handmade and I guess that sort of like now I'm like yeah obviously that's true but there's I think the thing that ended up feeling interesting to me about that was that it was like why does that seem so obviously true and yet it also feels like every time you go and try on clothes the feeling is that there's something wrong with your body, not that it's like, oh, what a, what, how it's such like, what a shame that like, we can't figure this, this technical problem out. Like it just does not have that feeling. And we, the fact that like, it's sort of been turned over onto us as like, there's something wrong with you rather than there's something wrong with the clothes. Mm -hmm. So that was something that surprised me. Um, it definitely surprised me. And then like the ways that that history that links to histories of eugenics and histories of standardization and um, mechanization and all these kinds of things. But one of my favorite stories that I kind of stumbled upon that I did not expect to find was the story of the fat fitness movement in the eighties. Um, you know, I, I, like I said, I knew I'd wanted to do something about buns of steel and about aerobics. And I sort of known the contours of that history, but um, I just, you know, one of the ways I did a lot of this research was I was like deep in the JSTOR kind of like how, you know, I, I would just sort of like keep researching, keep researching and find following, um, you know, following kind of citations through JSTOR. And I found this woman's work about the, the fat aerobics movement in the eighties, which was largely kind of concentrated on the West coast, although it ended up being everywhere. And it was this really interesting kind of antidote to the Jane Fonda and Greg Smithies, the people who are doing more kind of mainstream fitness stuff. And I ended up interviewing a couple of women who were a part of that movement and who had just had such kind of like really exciting, meaningful experiences as larger women, self-identified fat women who said they wanted to be part of this aerobics thing that was happening, but they didn't, they knew they weren't going to be able to create bodies that looked like Jane Fonda's and they weren't even going to try. And they actually were able to find something that like, I've never been able to find with exercise, which is like joy in movement that wasn't tied to changing their bodies and talking to them, to Rosella and Deb, it was just actually pretty profound for me. It kind of opened up some ways of thinking about movement and bodies that I had heard, but there was something about really hearing those first person's stories that was very moving to me. And um, it was just like so full of joy. And I think that's the thing in this book, like there's a lot of histories of 
control and um, kind of really sad stories like the story of Sarah Bartman and the long legacy of her autopsy that exists, you know, throughout the 19th and 20th century. But then stories like, like that one or the other one that kind of comes to mind with that is when I talked to the, um, this couple, these two guys who make butt pads for drag queens, like that was a total accident that I found that story, but they were like some of the most compelling people I've ever met doing reporting. And they were really full of fun and thinking ways of thinking about bodies that was not about control, but was actually about like, you know, broadening up our ideas about gender and presentation and like having fun and, you know, thinking about like how many ways could a butt look like, let's make a bunch of foam pads in our Coney Island <laughs> apartment and sell them to drag queens. Like it's a service that needed to be done. So yeah, I guess those were some of my fun yeah. surprises. Yeah. Yeah. No. And it's, it's wild. I'm wild because um, as you'll see, my next question is about um, joy. So I'm so glad that you took us there. And yeah, I mean, just thinking about in a way, like the arc of your answer to that question is so beautiful too, because there is something that feels almost like a mirror image about the um, this kind of collective uh, fallacy of sizing or something that we all participate in. And exactly as you say, this feeling of like our bodies are wrong rather than the sizing is wrong, but the kind of the like tyrannical idea, not just there, there are these numbers, but that they would actually, we've all kind of consented to believe that they would actually work. Like this idea of like, kind of this, the, the drag show or drag performance or like two guys making butt pads to make a butt look and feel like any way you want it to is so much like an explosion of all of that, right? It's like, we're not about like numerical sizes. We're about whatever the kind of like, existential philosophical opposite of that totally um, yeah and yeah I did want to write about I mean I did want to ask you about joy because it is such a part of this book I mean not only um kind of in thinking about um movement or twerking I mean you're quite complicated in your treatment of twerking but there's certainly quite a bit of um pleasure and expression there um thinking about drag thinking about bodily freedom like ways we kind of like reclaim the body um and yeah I want I, I wanted you to kind of tell the story of how joy came to this book and also maybe how it felt to write the the joy in this book like even just on the level of kind mm -hmm. of writing sentences about joy, populating joy with physicality and details. I mean, whether that was a kind of, whether there was something exhilarating about, about that alongside all the different other kinds of work you were doing to create this book. Yeah, that's such a good question. I mean, I think I, I pretty early on, I knew like, Sometimes I feel like the book is sort of like these, it's like there's a gesture and then there's a counter gesture. And I feel like that's a lot of the story of this book. It's like, there's the gesture of like sort of saying butts. And then it's like, there's this thing that I always end up sort of having to say, which is like, it's not, it's serious. You know, it's like, take it seriously. But then like, I also find myself after I've kind of tried to convince somebody that it's serious. I'm like, but it's not too serious. You know? And I think that, the joy thing, I always wanted, to, you know, I don't think it's, I think if you're going to write about bodies and talk about bodies at this length, you would sort of be doing a disservice to not include something about the pleasure of having a body, whether it's, you know, through sex or through dance or like, it just is such a part of the feeling of living in a body. And I would never want to you know, not to, to keep that too far out of the frame. And I think it's also something that like, I believe just politically is like, you know, I think political movements and, you know, just not just movements, but just like when we're thinking about any kind of social justice, it's, it's always useful to think about not just what we don't want, but what we want. And I think one of the things I really you know, it's just something I I, tr I try to always keep in my head. And so I, I'm sure that that's part of how I end up bringing it into my reporting and my research is that it's like, well, what are the, 
well, who are the people who feel pleasure about this part of their body? Who are the people who are enjoying having, you know, like I think the thing about the the drag section and how I ultimately ended up putting it where I did in the book, which is in sort of an unusual chronological place. I, it's like, after all this stuff about like feeling, like writing about sizing and how it feels so uncomfortable to not be able to find clothes that fit. It was like, well, who, who is finding clothes and not that don't just fit, but that make them feel more themselves. Like what's the kind of counter narrative to this, this primary narrative. And then as far as, it, I mean, those are some of my favorite sections to write. I think that for me, in some ways it's, it's easy. It's, it's not maybe easier is wrong. It's like, you never want to paint that with too broad of a brush either. Cause of course it's not like, oh, well, Deb never feels a complicated feeling about her body. Of course she does. And of course, you know, Vincent and Alex who make the butt pads do and I'm sure you know it's very complicated for them but I also think these are people who have thought a lot about that and it was very fun to have those conversations with them because we were kind of able to have the conversation at like a many levels like the ways it's hard to be you know like to have grown up like Alex did as a gay man in the south and to want to do drag and to have that be hard and to then move to New York where like at the time all the drag queens were like as he said like had bodies like Kate Moss but had wanted to have a body like Mae West, like, how, you know, all the, like, but he had thought about all that stuff so much and we were able to have really robust conversations about it. Um, and I think that was part of what was so fun about it was they were like, there were some people who in my reporting and the Vincent and um, Alex, the, the guys who do the butt pads were some of these people who like, they didn't laugh when I, said I wanted to write a book about butts they were like yeah that's a great idea and I think about butts all the time and I'm like pretty into it and I think there's a lot to say about it and I and so it was kind of fun to do that type of reporting with people who were like on the same butt page as I was totally like where have you been where have you been you know like yeah, <laughs> needed totally. this. um <laughs> yeah and I was thinking I was actually I was thinking about um other voices and the ways in which other voices through interviewing, through reportage, um, but also in more conversational ways that I wanna ask you more about, like other voices are just such a huge part of this book, even as it is so kind of shaped, as you've said, by by your curiosities and, and the places they took you to. And it feels like one, one way that surprise is both made possible and allowed to deepen the like intellectual reach of a of a project is by having other voices like that's kind of how we get surprised in this world is like people mm -hmm. say things that help us know something we didn't know before or think about something in a different way or even frame it in a different way it's like surprise isn't a sort of solipsistic sensation it's like a right. thing that comes relationally I think most of the time um so I want to I mean you you and I have talked so much and it's one of the parts of your writing practice that I admire so much, like the ways that you really think of the creative process as something that happens in community and in relation to other people and in conversation with other people. And I would just love to, I mean, there are so many directions you can take this question, but take it, take it wherever you want to. Like, I would love to just hear you talk a little bit about, um, how this book came to be and came to be what it was like through community, you know, that took the form yeah. of these questionnaires that you gave to people about their experience of like having a butt, um, conversations with friends, conversations with readers, inviting people to read the book. Um, of course, like the um, more formalized conversations that were part of this book, but how, how, Tell us some of the ways in which this book felt collaborative and like what that energy of engaging with other people and other lives and other voices, all those forms of it, kind of how they, how all those tributaries seeped into what this book became. Yeah, totally. I mean, I I was just remembering that there was this version of this book that was even more collab collaborative. Like I had this like very radical idea of like having a committee like we used to do with, um, with exhibits at Hull House where like there would be like, contributors and like people like joint authorship and all this but I I was it's hard enough to write a book I think to like reinvent the what a book is was maybe like a little bit too much for the first time out of the gate but um 
from the very beginning, I wanted to, you know, I was so aware from day one that like, I mean, what's true for everyone, which is like, I only am one person in one body. And I wanted to, if I was going to ever know anything about what it was like for other people in other bodies, whether they were bodies of people with different races or different gender identities or just different ages, different geographic, you know, different places where they grew up. Like I was going to have to bring voices in, in all kinds of different ways. So I did for, in the very beginning, for the first couple of years, I did alongside all of the other reporting, I was also doing these oral histories and having people fill out questionnaires that were in many ways, they're not, they're not on the page in this book, but they're kind of like behind a lot of the reporting. So I would do long oral histories with people about their bodies and just what it was like to live in their bodies. And I would sort of ask a similar set of questions to all of them. And then I had a questionnaire early on that I had people fill out that had a lot of those questions. And then I, I kind of realized that the oral histories were maybe a little bit better because I could listen and ask follow-ups and like people could talk for a long time and maybe it's a little bit easier to do it in person or in um, out loud rather than in writing. And those really, that was another way that some of my reporting got formulated and I made decisions about what to include and what not to include. And, and it was, you know, I think I was really excited about those because it felt like, like I was saying, like the, the, the experience of my own body that I was interested in wasn't an experience of something really dramatic. It was something relatively, I think, pretty normal and relatively mundane. But in order to access that same set of questions with other people, I was going to have to do this kind of, you know, like if my mundane shame was like, I feel like my butt's too big. I'm 15 years old. Like what, what is someone else's? The only way you can know that is by like really asking because it's not the kind of thing like somebody writes a feature story in the New York Times about you know so I um that's one way and then I also brought in you know I had lots of different readers at various stages throughout the process I I really you know like for better or worse I really thrive in conversation as a way of kind of coming to ideas so you know like I'm sure you and I did this, but my friend Lulu and I did this too, where I, like, I, at one point, I think I had Lulu interview me about the book, maybe several times so that I could sort of try to find the kernels of ideas that were kind of rising to the surface. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then I just really, you know, I, I wanted to have as many different kinds of writers and kinds of thinkers read and think alongside me as like they would be willing to do. And yeah, you have to be sort of careful about this because you're asking for a lot of free help essentially. But I also hope that what I can offer is to sort of do a similar type of thing for all those people in whatever way that would be useful to them. Yeah, well, and 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 I I know I know from knowing you that you do, and and I also really believe in that kind of constantly circulating gift economy or trade economy of um time and mind and eyes and and um thinking and the ways we all sort of like offer it to each other um and actually we were saying about some of those conversations with Lulu was connected to um to one more thing I'm going to ask you I mean I have a thousand things to ask you but um I think we already we already have at least one question and I would encourage people to um this is like one of the funnest books really to ask questions about <laughs> I mean Heather maybe maybe it's different for you Heather because you've literally been like fielding a million questions about this book for weeks with while taking care of your little baby um but I you know when you were talking about those conversations with Lulu I was I was thinking about how you also described as part of your work at Radio Lab the kind of like formalized or structured activity of the brain dump or is that what you call it so yeah yeah where you kind of do this, like, here's all my stuff about this that I've been thinking or that I found in my early reporting. Um, And that always struck me as like one of many very concrete ways that like radio work was feeding back into your life as a writer. Um, Not that that was its only value. But but I would just love... um, so you talk a little bit in terms of this book. I mean, some of the stuff you were saying about objects and that idea of like making an exhibit about anything um, is already told part of the story when it comes to a whole house. But just like you, you have these other lives in um, museum work and in radio work that are that are 
also about storytelling, telling stories about the world, figuring, find, kind of like finding the stories inside the vast, inside the ordinary, um, kind of making visible all these invisible things in the world around us. Um, and I would just love to hear you talk a little bit about how you brought those like radio and museum selves into the process of this book and um, both like kind of experientially and conceptually yeah um I mean definitely the museum stuff I feel like is pretty straightforwardly there like I, I I'm very interested in how objects and in this case I wrote a lot about clothes as objects can convey meaning in a way that's different than textual sources can which I know sounds a little boring when I say it like that but it's like you know what can a bustle tell us that like a newspaper article from 1882 can't? And I, I think it can actually tell us quite a lot. And I'd done enough work with objects in museum environments to sort of see what they, how they can open things up for people and bring people in a little bit of a different way than only using um, kind of text-based sources, basically. Um, you have that great that, I hope I won't botch it, but it's like a yeah. quote about objects as like, history is slip of the the like the slip of the tongue you know yeah totally yeah it's transformative for me actually that idea that an object is like not the composed version of history but just like the kind of the, the thing that slips out and survives yeah totally I mean I, I sort of think of objects as like yeah like the um, uh, it's a they can be a, they can be a way that we can sort of access a type of unconscious about the past and the present, you know, I think in, in sort of a similar way to what I think about, about butts, which is like, there's something that like, you almost don't take them seriously enough to then uh, a mad, like give them the, like, because they kind of exist below words or differently situated from words, there's a way that they can convey even more than words can, can convey. And I think with clothes in particular, the history of clothes is such a gendered history and there's a way that fashion is never taken as seriously as other forms of cultural production, which actually I think can afford it a little bit of like, like the unconscious can live a little bit more robustly there as a result. Uh, and then with the radio stuff, I mean, it's such, there's some very practical things like when I, you know, I Radio Lab helped me to go and do reporting like with the Man Against Horse race many, many years ago, um, I went and saw this crazy race in Arizona where humans run against horses and the humans win. And I was looking for someone to basically help me to pay for that part of my reporting by like just siphoning it off as a little article. And I pitched it to Radio Lab, and I've ever, you know, I, my friend Matt and I, we weren't friends then, but we are friends now. We went to, we went and saw this crazy race and, um, and I've been working with Radio Lab ever since, but I also think I was a radio producer before that. And, you know, I think there's a few different things. I think my writing voice is very uh, chatty or sort of, um, I don't know, it's it's not so different. Like, I, I think I write in a way that people speak often and that definitely comes from radio. I, I think I, I have a, it's a very aural experience for me to write. I read out loud. I try to feel like I can hear it in my head too. Um, and then I think that there's these kind of radio techniques of like, yeah, like the brain dump or the way that I even like transcribe tape. I mean, it's like pretty boring. I don't know how much you care about this, but I like, I like do this. I feel I'm just like more, more, more. <laughs> I, there's, you know, like maybe every writer does this, but when you, what radio producers do is they cut selects of tape. So it's like you go through and you listen to, you know, it's like, okay, I'm gonna listen to this whole interview and then I'm gonna take out the parts that are, I think are the, the best, most robust parts. And I, that's how I do, I had so much interview tape for this book in all these different ways. And so the first thing I would do is I would like run it through transcription software and then I would cut selects the way that we do at Radio, at radio Lab or at most radio shows. And then I would, it would like help me to kind of hone and hone what, what was kind of rising to the top and what meant the most to me. And I could, I wouldn't necessarily do that in like a Pro Tools type program, but um, kind of the methodology of radio is how I was first trained as like a nonfiction producer. And so I think that's something I, 
I bring in. And then I think with museum stuff, in addition to the objects thing, it's just, I think there's a way I think about audience that's very much more was formulated in my time at Hull House. And I think even the power relationship between the writer and the reader is something that I'm really interested in, just the way we, we always were thinking about what's the power relationship between the museum and the visitor. And I think that those can be really fruitful and kind of exciting modes of inquiry and also bringing in multiple, like a way we always created exhibits there was like, is like, let's bring in, you know, all these different nodes of making and, um, you know, like, like, okay, we're going to do an exhibit about food. Like let's interview a bunch of lunch ladies. Let's, talk to the farmers, let's, you know, talk to the, let's, you know, find an artist who's working in food. Like, let's just bring in as many different people into the mix as possible. And that's a way I think this book is really kind of was forged in the fires of those days at Hull House. Totally. That question of kind of like, who are we inviting to this party and, and, and what are they bringing? Um, I love all of that. Um, well, maybe let's turn it over. I would, um encourage anybody who's here go ahead and throw a question in the chat um we can and uh start with the one that's already there yeah, we have one question um please feel free as leslie said to submit any questions that you have uh viewer writes in you grew up with and now have relationships with boys and men how did those relationships affect your development <laughs> as a person and interest in this topic well, I think with my father, who was in the chat. Uh, I mean, I don't know. That's I, I don't know if I even know how to answer that question. Um, you know, the other, the one thing that's been kind of interesting about this book is Esquire magazine has been very excited about it, and actually, the for the live event tomorrow, and um, a woman who interviewed me for Esquire is going to interview me again, and. She asked me in the original interview, like, what do I want men to take away from this book? And it's so interesting because I I guess I think that I want men to take away from this book what I would want women to take away from this book, which is, you know, bodies are complicated places to live for all of us. And I think there's ways that specifically that women, um, unfortunately, are because of the power relationships because of the way fashion works and the way that women's bodies are always kind of policed a little bit differently than men's that like uh I, th I think women have a different experience of of that bodily complication but you know I think I think that some of the takeaways from the book are are takeaways for everybody you know like we hold there's a lot of unconscious meaning that's heaped onto bodies that doesn't come from them that's like not you know, it's, there's nothing innate about the butt that makes it mean something about human sexuality or about, um, you know, like, or about race or about gender, but we, those are meanings that we've sort of ascribed to it. And I think making those ideas visible rather than letting them remain invisible has been something that's been pretty profound for me. And I think can can be profound for for everybody what and like that's whether you're talking about men's bodies or women's bodies thank you that's the only question we have so far but um uh, leslie i'm happy to turn it over to you if you have one or two uh last questions and if there is a question a final question from the audience i will i will pop in to share it yeah no i have that i have a thousand i have a thousand more questions um but i know we don't have a thousand more hours um one of them i mean and I, I, I don't quite know um, how you'll respond to this, but in, in a way, it's like a question that's like, you know, infinite in what there is to say. But um, I guess I'm thinking about the fact that you've spent these five or six years writing about all the layers of meaning that our bodies hold and like using this particular part of the body to think about that question. And I'm curious how you had a baby this summer and I'm curious about how your experience of like living so intimately with another body um, that you're taking care of and also experiencing your kind of like having your own bodily experience of carrying a baby having a baby caring for a baby like how how have some of those like intellectual 
preoccupations with like what are all the layers of like history and meaning that live in our bodies like how how have those been um kind of carried to new or different places by this this like particular very intense bodily dimension of the last year of your life yeah totally yeah I mean I think I've you know when I was pregnant I had so many I kind of did a similar thing if not in a book but just sort of in my head and I, I got very interested in these kind of like what does the pregnant body mean and what does the postpartum body mean and wh- how are those things visible and where do those meanings show up and but you know the other thing about it is being pregnant and being in the early postpartum days it's so, it is not an intellectual experience or it's not certainly not only an intellectual experience it's like the cartesian divide is is, <laughs> is but you know i mean it's it i feel just like intellectualizing it didn't really change how or couldn't change how intense it was to just you know be nine months pregnant when in July and how hot and intense that felt or um and I think that's something that I haven't you know I, I these are questions I still sort of live with is just like what is thinking about bodies do for us that's like a little bit different than just feeling about bodies or, mm-hmm. and, you know, maybe, maybe something I'm interested in doing a little bit more is writing more about the experience of living inside of some of those bodily moments rather than only intellectualizing and historicizing them. I mean, one thing about this book was that I was, I was, um, I was really kind of right, like the the bodily experience, my own personal body bodily experience I was writing the most about happened 30 years ago. And I think the thing about pregnancy and birth and postpartum is like, it was, it was so viscerally happening now. And I think when I start to think about writing about those experiences, I'm, I, fi- I actually think some of the things that feel exciting about that are writing about like the, the lived mm-hmm. um, inhabited part of that, if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. We have a couple more questions. Um, thank you for our viewers who submitted questions. I think um, they came in at the same time, so I'll just choose randomly here. But this question maybe is fitting for a final question. Um, the viewer writes, when did you know the book was done? How did you discover its quote unquote end? Oh, man. I mean, to some extent, well, I mean, to, okay. So to some extent it was done because it was like had come up to the present moment. So I'd like, you know, it had completed its chronological trajectory, but, and I more or less did do the reporting in chronological order. So I guess that's one answer, but I also think like it was due was like the kind of classic answer. And I had already kind of taken longer because I had had a few different kind of you know, the COVID, COVID had hit and changed the reporting. I'd needed more time, but um, I mean, I really do think you could write about this. I know, I think sometimes people think this sounds bananas, but you could really write about this topic for a lifetime. Like you, you could go in so many, you know, it's like this book only takes place in the US and Western Europe. Like imagine if it had taken place in even just one more little part of the world, or if I had written about men's butts, or if I had, you know, written I always there was some reporting I was doing for a while about like the Italian American butt and the like 50s and 60s and the sort of like um, bombshell like there were just so many more things I could have included that didn't make it um so it, it kind of is like the classic answer of any kind of creative project is like it was done because it had to be done <laughs> and maybe someday there will be a sequel more but I think I'm done, but I hope somebody else is right. Well, we've reached the top of the hour here at At Home with Literati. You can, of course, purchase Butts, a backstory from Literati Bookstore. There's a link in the chat. If you're watching us later on YouTube, there's a link in the description below. Heather Radke, Leslie Jameson, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I hope to have you both in the store and the not too distant future. for your next books. But until then, take care. And to all of our viewers, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at the next event. Take care, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks, Heather. Thank you.